It's good to be back with you again for uh, this part of our gospel meeting. We have one lesson left after tonight, and I know many of you have been here for every lesson that we've had so far, and I want you to know that I'm appreciative of that. I'm thankful for your interest, and I'm thankful for the love, for the love that you have for God's Word to be willing to come out all these nights and to listen to it and to learn so that we can better equip ourselves for how to deal with denominational doctrines. Now in our lesson tonight, we're going to hit right down to the nitty gritty here. We're going to get right down to the real heart of the matter. We're going to be talking about denominationalism and very simply, we're just going to be asking the question, is denominationalism something that scripture will allow for? Very simple question. Because it boils down to either the Bible approves of denominationalism or it does not. So that's what we need to look at tonight. We need to understand what does Scripture teach us on this kind of a subject. Now, when you deal with denominationalism, kind of like what H.D. mentioned earlier, you know, denominationalism pervades our society. We've all grown up in it, we've all seen it, and it's affected us in some way or another because we all have family members in it, classmates, co-workers, friends. We have all kinds of people, relatives, and on down the list goes. We have all kinds of people that we know in denominationalism. It affects us. It, it's something that we deal with all of the time. Now, when you talk to most denominational people, the basic idea that they have is that, well, as long as you believe in Jesus and you are a good moral person, then that's the only thing that matters. Everything else that you do doesn't really matter. What you call yourself, how you believe you should go about worshiping, the type of church you attend, none of those things matter. As long as you just believe in Jesus and you're a good person, then all this other stuff doesn't matter. Well, let's talk about that tonight. Is it enough just to believe in Jesus? Really what I want us to do in our lesson is I want us to look at four major things here. What does the Bible say about the name that we should wear? the way that we should be organized, the type of worship God wants, and then finally we're going to look at the plan of salvation that God wants us to teach. And what we're really going to be doing is we're going to be seeing how does denominationalism fare in each of these four points. Okay? Let's start with point number one. Let's talk about the name that we wear. You know, one thing that has always thrown up a red flag to me is the fact that denominational churches do not wear scripturally authorized names. That throws up a red flag to me right there because they tell us, well, we want to follow the Bible. We want to do what the Bible says we should do. Well, if you really want to do what the Bible says you should do, then why are you wearing a name that the Bible does not authorize you to wear? That alone, that, that one point alone ought to get people to see that denominationalism really isn't following the Bible. Because if they're not following the Bible in something as simple as that, the name we call ourselves, if they're not following the Bible in something as plain and as simple as that should be, then what else are they not following the Bible in? That should throw up a red flag right there. Y'all, it's very simple. When you read the Bible and you look at the church of the New Testament, you're not going to see them wearing names like Presbyterian, Baptist, Methodist, Lutheran. You're not going to see those kinds of names. Now, what do most people say when you tell them something like that? You say, look, those names are not authorized for us to wear in the Bible. You know what they say. Well, it doesn't matter. God doesn't really care. All God cares about is that you believe in Jesus. Let's think about that. Does it, is that the way it really is for God? Does God just sit back and say, well, I don't care. Call yourself whatever. 
Let's turn our Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. As we're thinking about that question, let's notice this scripture. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and we're going to begin reading in verse 3. First Corinthians chapter 3, we're going to be reading here verses 3 and 4. First Corinthians 3, beginning here in verse number 3, Paul says, For ye are yet carnal, for where is there, am there is among you envying and strife and divisions? Are ye not carnal and walk as men? For while one saith, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are ye not carnal? Now, let's think about what's going on here in the church at Corinth at this time. What was going on is that many of the members of the Corinthian church were beginning to idolize and put up on a pedestal certain preachers. Well, we like Paul. Us people over here in the church at Corinth, we like Paul, so we're going to just start you know, go, going after what Paul is all about. And then you have this other group of people saying, well, we like Apollos, so let's just go ahead and put him up on a pedestal. You have division here. And you have people calling themselves by the names of these men. I am of Paul and I am of Apollos. Now, if what denominational people are telling us is true, well, it doesn't matter what name you call yourself by. It, it doesn't matter. Then Paul should say here, okay, well, Corinthians, y'all are calling yourselves by the names of these different people. Some of you are saying you're of Paul. Some of you are saying you're of Apollos. You're calling yourselves by the names of these men. It doesn't matter. As long as y'all believe in Jesus, don't worry about it. What does he say? For doing something like this, he tells them repetitively here that you, y'all are carnal. What does it mean when he says they are carnal? He's telling them they are fleshly or materially minded. You're not being spiritually minded here. When you're embracing this division, when, when y'all are causing all of this division, and you're calling yourselves by the names of these men, these are the things you're doing. You're causing division. You are being carnal. Question. Is it possible to please God when we are carnally minded? Now, I don't have to tell you what Romans chapter 8, verses 7 and 8 says, because you know it. The carnal mind is at enmity with God. It is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. And Paul goes on to say, So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. Put these two verses together. Calling yourselves by the names of men, embracing this division, the Bible says, is to be carnal. Romans chapter 8 says to be carnal is to be in a state where you cannot please God. Does it matter to God that we have unity? Does it matter to God the name that we wear? I think 1 Corinthians 3 answers that question. Now, let me move it a little bit forward here for you and let me show you a common rebuttal that denominational people like to make to this. They'll say, okay, I see the point that you're making. You're, you're telling us we need to wear scriptural names and names like Presbyterian, Pentecostal, Baptist, Methodist, okay. They're not scriptural. But they will argue that they are scriptural names. They'll say, we beg to differ. We, we think these are scriptural names. For an example, you, you think about the Pentecostal church, okay. Pentecostal people will say, well, the, the word Pentecostal is authorized. I mean, come on. They'll say the Bible talks about the day of Pentecost, doesn't it? So Pentecost is in the Bible, so why can't we call ourselves the Pentecostal church? And as a matter of fact, the reason they call themselves the Pentecostal church is because they say we're the church that was started there on the day of Pentecost. Pentecostal church. He said, that's pretty good reasoning. And then think about the Baptist church. They say, come on, y'all, John the Baptist. I mean, that's in the Bible, isn't it? So don't tell us we don't have scriptural names. That's biblical names. Those are words found in the Bible. We didn't just necessarily pull these out of thin air. I mean, that's found in the Bible. Okay. Just because a word is found 
in the Bible, a word, a name, or a phrase, just because it may be found in the pages of the Bible, does not mean God wants you to wear that name. Okay, reason with me here. Y'all, Judas is in the Bible, isn't it? Jezebel, that's in the Bible. Why don't we call ourselves the first Jezebel church? First church of Judas. And if somebody sits there and says, well, I don't think you should call yourself by that name, we can just sit there and tell them, well, it's in the Bible. See, just because it's in the Bible doesn't mean you're authorized to wear that kind of a name. Now, I know some people sit there and say, well, of course nobody would wear the name Judas or Jezebel because, you know, those are bad names. Nobody wants to call themselves by a bad name, like they, you know, even if it's found in the Bible. They'll say, but, you know, names like Pentecost, Pentecostal or Baptist, those are good, good words found in the Bible. So surely it would be okay for us to call ourselves by those words, right? Let's look at our text again. 1 Corinthians 3, 3 and 4. These people were calling themselves by the, the names Paul and Apollos. Wouldn't you say those are good names? I sure would. Those are great names. Th these were great men. Paul doesn't say, well, you know, I'm flattered you want to call yourself by my name, and I'm a pretty good guy, so go ahead. I don't see any harm in that. These are good Bible names, right? But he still tells them whenever you're doing these kinds of things, that's carnality. That's carnality. And again, just think about this. We know good and well that according to the Bible, the church belongs to Jesus. Just use some common sense. If it belongs to Jesus, then shouldn't we let the world know? You know, I've encountered denominational people on many different occasions who would tell me that yeah, you know, we, we, we want to be what God wants us to be. We want to be the way the church should be. We want to follow the Bible. We want to be, I've heard them say they want to be the church of the Bible. If you want to be the church of the Bible, you want to be that church that really belongs to Jesus, then why don't you let the world know that? Why don't you tell the world we are the church of Jesus? Why don't you do that? Instead of wearing all these other names, that Scripture simply does not authorize you to wear. Well, let's move on. We looked at name. Let's look at organization. Okay? We've seen that denominational, denominationalism is not scriptural in the kind of names that they wear. Let's look at organization. When you look at the church of the Bible, you're not going to read about there being any kind of worldly headquarters. You know, today there are all these different brands of churches that we have today. So many of them have all these different kinds of world headquarters. I mean, the Jehovah's Witnesses have the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society. The Catholic Church has the Vatican. On down the list we could go with all these different world headquarters. They didn't have a convention like the Southern Baptist Convention. They didn't have creed books or church manuals to tell them how they're supposed to be organized and the way they're supposed to be structured and the way they're supposed to go about doing things. They had God's Word. The church of the Bible did not have these kinds of things. You want to know where their headquarters was? Their headquarters was not located here on this earth. Their, their headquarters was located in heaven. You want to know why it was located in heaven? Because that's where the head of the Bible church is found. Christ is the head of the church, and Christ is in heaven, and that's where he rules from. Turn your Bibles to Mark 16, verse 19. Mark 16. We're going to be reading here verse 19. Mark chapter 16, notice here with me verse number 19. It says, So then, after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and set on the right hand of God. 
When the Bible tells us that Christ has gone to heaven and there in heaven he has sat down at the right hand of God, it doesn't mean that he's sat down and he's just sitting there doing nothing, twiddling his thumbs. What is he doing there? He's reigning. He is reigning as king over his kingdom. This passage lets me know this is where the headquarters of the Bible church is found. If I am in a church that has some other kind of headquarters, in addition to this, am I really in the Bible church? I would seriously question that. Well, let's move on and get a little bit more specific. We know that in the majority of denominations, they function under what we typically refer to as the one-man pastor system. You have one particular congregation, and in that congregation you have one man who serves as the pastor, and under him you have a board of deacons. One man pastor with multiple deacons. Okay, that's usually the way things are done. That's usually the way that denominational people think that the church is just supposed to be. You're supposed to have one guy that we call the pastor and then a bunch of deacons underneath him. Is that biblical? Do you ever read about that in the church of the Bible? I would love to be able to show you a passage that said that. I would love to be able to turn, say, turn to this verse right here and here's where we read about one man pastor. You don't read that in the Bible. But let me show you what we do read. Look in Acts chapter 14. Acts 14, verse number 23. Acts 14, you're reading about the apostles and the work that they were doing. And notice one of the things that they strove for. As they were going about doing their work, this was one of the things they were involved in. Acts chapter 14, verse number 23. It says, And when they had ordained them elders in every church and prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord on whom they believed. This verse lets me know the apostles were going around doing something. What were they doing? Well, the verse says they were ordaining elders in every church. Let's think about this for just a second. Elders in every church. You may have noticed that the word elders is plural. It doesn't say that they were ordaining an elder, singular, in every church. It says they were ordaining elders, plural, in every church. Singular. Church is singular there. This verse lets me know that for every one church... They were putting elders, plural, into them. Not just one, but a plurality of them in every church. One thing I think, though, that denominational people don't recognize. They don't recognize that when the Bible talks about elders and pastors, that it's talking about the same thing. I really think they don't get that. And the same is true with the word bishop. They don't recognize that bishop is synonymous with elder. What we need to understand is that those three terms, bishop, elder, and pastor, they're synonymous. That's referring to the same office. You may think, well, how do we know that? You can tell me they're all referring to the same office, but I don't care. Well, here's how we know that, okay? Think about the word pastor for just a minute, okay? The word pastor refers to a shepherd, someone who takes care of a flock, okay? Now think about the word bishop. Bishop means an overseer, somebody who oversees something. Okay, I want you to keep that in your mind, okay? Keep those definitions in your mind. Let's go and look in 1 Peter chapter 5. 1 Peter chapter 5. And I want you to read with me verses 1 and 2. 
First Peter chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. He says, The elders which are among you I exhort, who am also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind. Okay, verse number one, Peter says he's talking to the elders, okay? Talking to the elders. What are the elders supposed to do? Look in verse number two. Here's what the elders need to be doing. Feed the flock of God. That's what a pastor is, right? The word pastor means somebody who takes care of a flock. Who has the responsibility to take care of the flock here? The elders. But then keep reading here in verse number 2. After he tells them to take care of the flock, he, didn't, he then tells them that they're supposed to be taking the oversight. That's the definition of bishop. This verse makes it crystal clear. It couldn't get any plainer than this verse. Those three terms, elder, bishop, and pastor, are referring to the same office. And the Bible makes it clear that when a church has elders, there's supposed to be a plurality of them, not just one. And while I'm thinking about this, you know, one thing that I have seen is that in a lot of denominational churches, they have that one-man pastor with some deacons. And a lot of times it will be where the one-man pastor runs the show and the deacons are underneath him and they submit to him and basically do what he tells them to do. But I've seen it a lot of times the reverse, where the deacons run the show and tell the pastor what to do. And then I've even seen it where the deacons and the pastor don't make any decision. They don't do any kind of leading. Well, the church does. I've seen it before in denominations where they have church business meetings. And what they do basically is they all assemble together and whenever they have to go to make a decision, the church just votes on it. All the pastor does is just carry out the will of the church. And that never made sense to me because I'm thinking the church is just leading itself. The pastor isn't shepherding anything. The flock is just shepherding itself. They're making all the decisions for themselves. They're really shepherding the pastor because he's the one who carries out their will. You see how unbiblical things can get when we don't follow the way God wants His church to be organized? And I hear it all the time. Well, it doesn't matter. As long as I believe in Jesus, it doesn't matter. Well, if it doesn't matter the way the church is organized, then why in the world why in the world did Paul and the apostles spend so much time and so much effort trying to establish elders in these churches when in the end it really didn't matter? Why waste your time on something that doesn't matter at all? Who cares? Save your breath, Paul. Save your energy. We don't need that anyway. That's just the way you think it can be. We can have one elder if we want to. We can do this, we can do that, as long as we believe in Jesus. You know, if, if it's true that the only thing that matters is that you just believe in Jesus and all this other stuff in the Bible that talks about the way the church should be organized, we really can just ignore that. Because we don't really have to do that, do we? That's not going to affect anything. All this stuff that Paul talks about all this stuff we read about in the New Testament talks about the way God wants His church to be structured. We really could just cut that out, you know? Just the only thing, if the only thing that matters is believing in Jesus, the only thing that we should care about is just those verses that talk about believing in Jesus and cut out everything else. Foolishness. See, it boils down to we care more about the way we want the church to be structured instead of the way that God wants it to be structured when we have that kind of an attitude. When we say it just doesn't matter, we can do it however we want to do it. That's really the attitude that's being displayed there. Well, let's move on now to our third point. I want you to be thinking about worship. 
does God care about how I worship Him? Or is that just another trivial matter that really in the end isn't going to make a difference because all that really matters is I have faith in the Lord? Okay, let's think about that. Now, I could spend a lot of time on this point showing you all the different things, all the different ways of worship that all these different religious groups are involved in that are just simply not biblical, simply not authorized by Scripture. Now, the one I'm going to talk to you about is probably the most common uh, worship practice that's brought into question, and that is, of course, instrumental music. And the reason I'm talking to you about it tonight is because that's the most common con concern that people have. Is that really something that we can do? You know, I, I've heard so many times denominational people try to justify the use of instrumental music from the Bible. They've got a lot of arguments they try to make from Scripture to justify that practice. Now, I could spend a whole lesson or a whole series of lessons showing you every argument that they make to try to justify it. I don't have time to do all that. So what I'm going to do in this lesson is I'm just going to give you one of their most powerful arguments that they think they have in order to justify the use of instrumental music. I want you to turn your Bibles to, Re to Revelation chapter 14. Revelation 14. And we're going to be reading here verses 1 to 3. Revelation chapter 14, verses 1 to 3. John is writing here and he says, And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Sion, and with him a hundred and four thousand, hundred and forty and four thousand, having his father's name written in their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of a great thunder, and I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps. And they sung, as it were, a new song before the throne, and before the four beasts, and the elders, and no man could learn that song but the hundred and forty and four thousand which were redeemed from the earth. Let me sum it up for you. John is given a vision. And what he is given a vision of is basically heaven. He sees the throne of God. And he sees all the people who have been redeemed out of the earth. He is being given a vision of heaven here. Well, what are the people who are in heaven, what are they doing here? Well, verse 3 says that they're singing. But if you look in verse number 2, Verse number 2, John goes on to say that he hears the sound of harpers harping on their harps. Now, the argument that's made from this is, well, obviously, these redeemed Christians in heaven are using instrumental music. And if they're using instrumental music in heaven, then why can't we use instrumental music here on earth in the church? Why not? And... You know, sometimes they'll argue from Old Testament passages, you know, oh, well, David, David played on the harp. And we always tell them, you know, look, that was the Old Testament. You know, you can't bring that over because that's the Old Testament. Here's what they'll do with this verse. This ain't Old Testament. There's New Testament right here. So you Church of Christ folks, y'all can't use that Old Testament thing on us. This is New Testament. Okay? Is this verse authorizing you and me to use instrumental music. Let's just look at the passage and let's look at it very carefully, okay? What I want you to recognize is that in verse 2, when he talks about harpers harping on their harps, the harps that he's mentioning here are not literal. These are not actual, literal, physical harps here. These harps that he's describing are figurative. You say, well, how, how do you know it's figurative? Well, to begin with, 
We all know that the book of Revelation is a symbolic book. Revelation 1 verse 1 says it's a book that was spoken in signs, spoken in symbols. We know that. And then just look at the immediate verse that we've just read. Okay? Look in verse 1. In verse 1, John said, I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Sion, and with him 144,000. Did John see a literal lamb? Is, is the lamb literal here? I don't know a denominational person, one, who would say, yeah, it's a literal lamb. They understand that the lamb is figurative here. What does the lamb represent? Christ. Everybody that I've asked, denominational or otherwise, agrees. That's talking about Christ. The lamb here is figurative. That right there from the get-go ought to tell you I'm dealing with a figurative passage. But don't just stop there Go into verse number 2. There's a lot of figurative language I could point out to you. I'll just point out a few things. If you go into verse number 2, he says that he hears this water and this thunder in heaven. Is there going to be literal running water in heaven? Is there going to be literal thunder blasting out there in heaven? You know, I really wanted to know what denominational people thought about that. I thought, do they take the thunder and the literal, or the, the water and the thunder literal? I did as much research into it as I could. I read all these denominational commentaries, and every one of them that I read said that the thunder and the water is symbolic. It's figurative. And they went on to tell you, here's what it symbolizes. Okay, all right, think about it. Let's get this straight now, okay? So all these things are figurative, 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 symbolic, symbolic. But we come to the hearts, and all of a sudden, literal. What? Really? So everything in this passage and everything, everything in this context is figurative, but we come to the harps. Well, that is real, that's literal, actual physical harps they have there in heaven. See, that's really a biased way of approaching the text. Let me show you what harps symbolize here. They symbolize something. What do they symbolize? Harps symbolize the sound of their singing. What John is describing here in verse 2 when he talks about, I hear the sound of water, I hear the sound of thunder, I hear the sound of harpers harping, he's describing in a poetic, symbolic, figurative way the way that their singing sounds. Look, I mean, just look in verse number 2. He says, I hear the voice, or I heard a voice from heaven as of a, as of a voice of many waters and as of a, a voice of a great thunder. And I heard the voice of harpers harping on their harps. I hear this great sound. This is what it sounds like. What was he actually hearing? Verse 3. Verse 2, he tells you what it sounds like. Verse 3, he tells you what it actually is. And they sung. By harpers harping on their harps, he's telling you this is the way their singing sounded. It was a melodious sound that I heard. That's what he's saying here. Now, I know some people aren't going to be convinced by that. Some people say, well, I'm just not convinced. I don't think this should be figurative. I still think it's literal. Okay, here's what I want you and me to do. For the sake of just, for the sake of argument here, let's hypothetically assume that the harps are literal. Let's just assume that. Let's assume in heaven they do have actual harps and they're playing them. If that was the case, that still would not authorize you and me to have them here on the church on earth. You say, well, why not? They got it in heaven. Surely we could have it here on earth. What people fail to recognize is that just because they may have or do something in heaven doesn't mean we're authorized to do it here on earth. Just because that's the way it is in heaven doesn't mean that's the way it's going to be here on earth. Let me just give you a few points as to what I mean. Revelation chapter 21 verse 4 
John tells us that in heaven, God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more sorrow, no more pain, no more death, no more tears in heaven. Now, I could look at that and say, well, if there's not going to be any pain, sorrow, death, or tears in heaven, then that ought to be the way it is in the church. That ought to be the way that it is here in this life, because that's the way it is in heaven. You know that's not the way it is in this life. There's still sorrow. There's still pain. There's still death. Just because that may be the way it is in heaven doesn't mean that's going to be the way it is here on earth. And then Philippians chapter 3 verses 20 and 21 tell us that when Christ returns and the resurrection occurs, that we are going to be given a glorious body like unto His. He will take and fashion our corrupt physical body that can decay away and he will fashion it into a spiritual body and will be in that body for eternity. Why can't I look at that and say, well, if that's the way it is in heaven, that ought to be the way it is here on the church on earth. See, just because they may have, you may have that in heaven doesn't mean you're going to have that here on earth. So even if these harps were literal, and they're literally going to have that in heaven, it doesn't mean you're going to have it here on earth. And here's another thing I want to point out to you. Really, denominational people who go to this passage for authority, for instrumental music, it's a biased argument. It's biased. Because if you look in the book of Revelation, there's a lot more things in heaven beside harps. I mean, if you look here in verse number 3 of Revelation 14. Revelation 14, verse 3. Not only are there harps, but in verse 3, John says there are four beasts in heaven. Okay? Think about it. If we're going to go to verse 2 and say, well, they got harps in heaven, so we should have harps in the church. Why can't I go to verse 3 and say, they got four beasts in heaven. We should have four beasts in the church. Let's get us a cow, a pig, a horse, a donkey, and we'll put them right here. Why not? Why, why just pick out the harps and then ignore everything else they have in heaven? Revelation chapter 5 verse number 8 says they have golden bowls Full of incense in heaven. Let's get us some golden bowls and put right here and start burning some incense. I don't know hardly any denominations that would do that, that would agree with that. Now some might, but the majority of them that I know wouldn't agree with that. Revelation chapter 8 verse number 3 says there's a golden altar in heaven. They got a golden altar in heaven, let's have it right here. Oh no, 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 they wouldn't do that. Denominational people wouldn't do that. No, we shouldn't have these four animals. Can't have none of that. No, no, we ain't going to have golden bowls of incense. No, 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 we ain't going to have this big golden altar. No, 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 no. Come to hearts. Oh, we'll take that. Y'all, that's a biased argument. That's as biased as you could be. So even if you take these harps literal, no matter which way you go, bottom line... The church is still not authorized to use such. Well, let's move on and let's talk about another aspect of worship that we commonly um, try to help denominational people recognize as something they ought to be doing. Let's talk about the Lord's Supper. Now, most denominational churches will do the Lord's Supper, but as you know, a lot of them think that, well, the Lord's Supper isn't something that we should do every Sunday. It's something that we should just do on various occasions. Where I'm from, most of the denominations usually do it about once a month. That seems to be the going rate of the Lord's Supper where I'm from. Once a month. And they tell us, well look, you know, y'all keep telling us we need to do it every Sunday. Where does the Bible say do it every Sunday? That's what I always hear. Well, where does the Bible say that? I mean, 
Look at Acts 20, verse number 7. We, we know Acts 20, verse number 7. It says, Upon the first day of the week, the disciples came together to break bread. Sometimes we'll show them that verse and say, There it is. You know what they'll say when you show them that verse? Don't say every. <laughs> don't, don't say every, every first day of the week. Come on. Let's reason a little bit, okay? You know, back in the Old Testament, God told the Israelite people they were supposed to remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. That was part of the Ten Commandments. Show me a verse where God commanded them to remember every Sabbath day and keep it holy. It's not there, is it? Well, did the Israelite people look at that and say, well, God didn't say every and so we'll just, I don't know, we'll keep one Sabbath of the month. Yeah, we'll do that. You see the Israelite people doing that? Read the Old Testament. How often did they keep the Sabbath? Once a month, once a year, however often they felt was good. They did it every time it rolled around. God didn't have to say every. When God said, remember the Sabbath and keep it holy, that meant when the Sabbath gets here, you keep it holy. When Acts 20 verse 7 says they broke bread on the first day of the week, that meant that when the first day of the week got there, buddy, that's what they were doing. It doesn't have to say every. But let me satisfy some people. because Some people still aren't convinced even by that. Oh, I'm still not convinced. I want every. Okay. Turn your Bibles to 1 Corinthians 16. 1 Corinthians 16. Let's read verses 1 and 2. First Corinthians 16, verses 1 and 2. Paul writes, Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given order to the churches of Galatia, even so do ye. Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store, as God hath prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. You say, why are you quoting this verse to us? This verse is talking about giving. I thought you was talking about the Lord's Supper. I'm going to show you something here. When did they take up a collection? When was Paul telling them they were supposed to do that? Well, verse 2 says, upon the first day of the week. Now, let me tell you something here. In the original language, the word every is there. The King James Version doesn't bring it out, but other versions like the English Standard Version and the New American Standard Version, they do bring that Greek word out. In the original language, it actually says, upon the first day of every week. It's there. And denominational people are pretty big about bringing that out. You talk to denominational people, they'll bring that out. Oh yeah, give every first day of the week. They don't skip that. Oh no. And a lot of them will argue for that. In the original language, it's there. It is. This verse lets me know, okay? The point I'm making here is that this verse lets me know that the Christians of the first century came together on what first day of the week? Every first day of the week they were coming together, okay? They didn't come together one first day of the week out of the month. They came together every first day of the week. Okay. What did they do upon the first day of the week? Let's turn and look in chapter 11. I want you to notice this scripture. Let's put these two scriptures together. Acts chapter 11, look in verse number 20. Now in Acts chapter 11, Paul is dealing with how the Corinthians have corrupted the Lord's Supper. He's correcting them. He's showing them how they've corrupted it, and he's going through fixing it, showing them what they really need to be doing. And look what he tells them in verse number 20. Verse number 20 he says, When ye come together therefore into one place, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper. He's saying, look, y'all come together, but y'all really are not coming together to eat the Lord's Supper. Y'all are just coming together to do your own thing. 
the verse lets me know that they should be coming together to be taking the Lord's Supper. The point I want you to see from this passage is that when the Christians of the first century came together, what did they do? They took the Lord's Supper. When they assembled, they ate the Lord's Supper. Well, how often did they assemble? I just showed you 1 Corinthians 16 too. Every first day of the week. So let's put it together. They took the Lord's Supper whenever they would assemble together. When did they assemble together? Every first day of the week. If they were assembling every first day of the week and they ate the Lord's Supper when they assembled, they were eating the Lord's Supper every first day of the week then. You see how simple that is? You just put these two scriptures together and it makes it crystal clear to you. You know, when denominational people assemble on Sunday but fail to take the Lord's Supper, they're really missing the entire purpose of the assembly. That's one of the major reasons we assemble together is to be able to do that. And they miss it. Well, again, when it comes to worship, they'll say, it doesn't matter. How can you say that? If it doesn't matter how we worship God, that doesn't matter. That does, uh, you just got to believe in Jesus. That's the only thing that matters. If it doesn't matter how we worship God, then why don't we go through the New Testament and everything that deals with how to worship God, we should just write that off as the apostles' opinion. Well, Paul says to sing, and he says to do this, and that. we don't really have to do that. That's just the way Paul thinks it should be done. We could do that with everything. Ridiculous. Y'all, I don't think God wasted His breath trying to teach us how to worship if in the end it's not really going to matter. Y'all, I think God spent so much time in the New Testament telling us this is how you need to worship because it matters. It matters. That's why God gave us such detailed instructions in the New Testament about how He's supposed to be worshipped. It matters. If it didn't matter, God was just wasting His time telling us that. Well, let's move on to our final point. And this is the major point of all the points that should show why denominationalism is not right. It all boils down to this. Let's just assume that denominationalism gets these three points that we looked at so far. Name, organization, and worship. Let's just say they got all that right. They call themselves by the name of Christ. They call themselves by a name that Scripture authorizes. They were organized the way the Bible says they should be. They worship the way God says they should be. If they get this last point wrong, point number four, the plan of salvation, how a person is supposed to be saved, then all that's in vain. The main reason, y'all, that denominationalism is wrong is simply because they are teaching a false plan of salvation. That's what it boils down to. When we go out there to help our denominational friends recognize that denominationalism is not, is not right, that really needs to be what we show them. You think you've accepted Christ. You're as sincere as you can be. You're a great person. You're a great friend. But I love you so much, I want you to know that you really have not accepted the gospel. That's why denominationalism is not right. It's not right because those people in it are not really saved. They're not a part of the true one body of Christ, the true one church that belongs to Christ, because they don't really belong to Him. They're not truly saved. Say, well, why are they not truly saved? Because they're teaching a false plan of salvation. Y'all... Our lesson last night was, is baptism essential for salvation? The majority of the denominational world denies baptism. You cannot be a part of Christ's one true saved body when you deny the very act in which he says you enter that body. That's what it boils down to. When they deny that baptism is essential for salvation, they are not a part of his body. Now, whenever we teach people that, that baptism is essential and they begin to see it from the Bible 
what's the first thing they're going to say? Well, I've been baptized, right? I've been baptized, so I'm okay. What you need to do, what we need to be doing, is we need to show people that, look, I know you went through that act. I know you were immersed under the water. Now, some people aren't. Some people are sprinkled. If you run into somebody who's been sprinkled or poured, you need to sit down and tell them that's not baptism. Baptism is immersion. Colossians 2.12 says we are buried with Christ in baptism. It's immersion. But when you run into somebody and they say, well, I, I have been immersed. I've been, I've been pushed under that water. What you need to show that person is, look, I know you've gone through that act, but where was your heart? What was the reason for you to get baptized? Why were you doing that? What was your reason for doing that? If your reason was not right, if you were being baptized for the reason of, well, I believe I'm already saved, I'm just doing this to appease somebody, or I'm doing this to show that I'm saved, you were not baptized for the right reason. You say, what's the right reason? You need to be baptized for the reason of, I want my sins forgiven. If you were baptized for any other reason than that, that baptism is not scriptural. You know, I've had people argue with me, it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter what your reason is, just as long as you did it. Let's look at what the Bible says about that. Look in 1 Peter 3, 21. Very classic scripture. 1 Peter 3, 21, Peter says, The like figure whereunto baptism doth also now save us. Now, usually we'll stop right there. Don't stop right there. When you show somebody the scripture, don't stop there. You read the rest of that passage. Baptism doth also now save us, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience towards God. See, we skip that part. You say, what's that mean? What's that part mean? You know, usually we skip that because we're not quite sure what that means ourselves. The part where he says, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience towards God, let me explain to you what that means. He says baptism saves, and then he goes on to explain how baptism saves. That phrase there, not the putting away the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience towards God, that's Peter explaining how it saves. He says baptism is not the putting away of the filth of the flesh. In other words, baptism doesn't save you because it's cleansing your flesh. It's washing dirt off your body. That's not why you're supposed to be getting baptized. That's not how baptism saves you. It's not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but he says it's the answer of a good conscience towards God. Think about the word answer. He says it's the answer of a good conscience. Now, when we think about the word answer, we think about giving a reply to somebody. Somebody has asked me a question and now I'm going to give them a reply. That's what we think of when we think of the word answer. That's not what it means here. This word answer means to make a request. It means to make a strong plea to somebody for something. What the verse is actually saying is that when we are baptized, we are making an appeal to God for a clean conscience. We are asking God to cleanse us. That's what it's saying there. Baptism doesn't save you because it's meant to wash dirt off your body. Baptism saves you because in baptism you are making an appeal to God to save you. That's what your reason needs to be when you are baptized. That's the reason for it. You say, well, I just don't think that the reason matters. I think as long as I've done it, I'm good. Y'all, you know that's not true. And denominational people know that's not true. I mean, think about it this way. If I came to worship, and I went through all the acts of worship, I sang, I gave, I took the Lord's Supper, I did everything. But I didn't do it for the right reason. I didn't do it to bring glory to God or to worship Him or to praise Him. I just did it because I don't want to look bad. If I don't go to church today, folks will start talking, folks will start thinking bad about me, so I just go and get it over with. 
don't care about God. I'm not going for Him. My reason is I just don't want to look back. Would God accept that worship? No, He wouldn't accept that. Well, why not? I, I did it. I did the act. The acts that He wanted me to do, I did them. Yeah, but your heart wasn't in it. You didn't do it for the right reason. Everybody understands that when it comes to worship. Even denominational people understand that. Well, why can you not understand why can you understand that about worship? But when it comes to baptism, oh, your reason doesn't matter there. First Peter 3:21 makes it clear, yeah, your reason does matter. Let me give you another scripture that shows you that your reason and your intent for being baptized does matter. Colossians 2:12. I've been showing it to you all week. Colossians 2.12 Paul says that in baptism we are buried with Christ. We're buried with Him in baptism. And there in baptism the Bible says we are raised with Him through the faith of the operation of God. When I am baptized I need to be putting my faith into the operation of God. When I am being baptized, I need to be putting my faith into the fact that God is now going to be working upon me. Working upon me how? What's God going to be doing to me there? Verse 13. He is going to cleanse you and forgive you of all trespasses. When I am baptized, that's what I need to be understanding. My faith needs to be in that. My faith does not need to be in, well, I'm already saved. I'm already cleansed of my sin. That doesn't need to be where your faith is. My faith needs to be that now in this act, God is cleansing me. God is operating upon me. He is removing my sin. Your reason for baptism matters. And we need to be able to show that to our friends. We need to be able to show that to our family members. Whenever they start saying, well, you know, I've done that. Okay, don't get on to me for that. I've done that. I'm okay. I'm, I'm fine. Let them know. Did you do it for the right reason? You know, it's as simple as this. There is no such thing as accidentally getting baptized right. There is no such thing as accidentally getting saved. Well, I got dunked under the water. My reason wasn't right. But somehow or another, I got saved. I didn't believe baptism was essential. I believed I already was saved before then, and, but somehow or another my baptism saved me. You do not accidentally get saved. You need to make that clear to people. God cares about where your heart is. God cares about the intent in which you do that. Y'all, denominationalism is all over the place. We need to know why it's wrong. We need to be able to show our friends and our family members why it's wrong. You know, if you want to bring them out of that, you want to bring your family out of denominationalism, you know what you're going to have to do? Let them know they're lost. Think about it. Well, I don't want to do that. If they don't think that they're lost, why would they ever leave? Why would they ever see the need to? You can't save somebody who doesn't recognize that they're lost. That's what it boils down to. You're not going to get anybody to do anything if they think they're already okay. Why do something? I'm fine. You know, they're just, if you sit there and tell them, yeah, you know, you should, you should become a part of the Church of Christ, they're going to think, you just want me to join your denomination. I'm already saved in the one I'm at. They ain't going to listen to that. We need to show them from the Bible what you're in is wrong. Here's why. Don't give them your opinion. Your thoughts. You give them straight Bible. Give them the text. Give them the scripture. And let them know as humbly as you can what you've obeyed, the gospel you think you've accepted, you haven't. You are lost. And I love you so much, I want you to know that. Well, I might, I might upset them. Let me tell you something. If you keep your mouth shut and you never tell them anything, you may spare their feelings, but you will not spare their soul. And you're going to have to ask yourself, what means more to me? Their feelings or their soul? 
Feelings are only temporary. Their soul is going to go on for eternity. You know, we're not out to hurt people's feelings. That's not our objective. We're out to give them the truth in the best way that we know how. And we can't let the fear of, well, you know, they may not take it too well, or this could cause a ruckus, or this could possibly upset somebody. We shouldn't let those kinds of things silence us. Because when we do, the devil is one. Do you not realize that's the tactics that he uses? Do you not realize that? That's how cunning he is. He uses your own love for those people against you. Yeah, that dude knows what he's doing. He knows how to get us to be quiet. He knows, he knows how to keep us from, spe from spreading the gospel the way that we should. The key is recognize the tactics of the devil and learn to overcome them. Don't let that stop you from sharing the gospel. Romans 1.16, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ it is the power of God unto salvation. If you're here among us this afternoon and you're not a member of the church of Christ, the church that is Christ's, then we want you to know that you can become a part of that church. You can obey the gospel. You can have your sins forgiven. The Bible says if you'll believe in Jesus, repent of the sins you've committed in your life, confess His name before men, and then be baptized, immersed in water, you can have all the sins that you've committed forgiven by the blood of Christ. If you're here among us and you have done those things, but you've strayed away and you're not living as a faithful Christian should, we also want to give you the invitation as well to repent, to come back, and to be restored. If we can help you in any way this afternoon, why don't you let it be known as together we stand and as we sing.